Hi, and thank you for joining for another edition of Women at Iowa, a show documenting the lives, work, and history of women at the University of Iowa campus. I'm your host for today, Erin Tysman. My guest today is Dr. Gigi Durham, professor of journalism here at the university. Her new book, The Lolita Effect, discusses the sexual sexualization of teens and the media. Thank you for joining us today, Gigi. Oh, it's great to be here. <laughs> thank you. Can you share with us a little bit about your book and your background in, in this particular subject? Um, yeah, well, the, the book, um, as you said, the subtitle is The Media Sexualization of Young Girls and What We Can Do About It. And the focus is actually on the myths of sexuality, of female sexuality that's, uh, that are in media that are specifically targeted to teens and preteens. Actually, I look at younger girls as well, and media aimed at younger girls in particular. Um, my background, um, well, I do feminist media studies. That's my research area. And um, I've been looking at representations of women's bodies and sexuality in various media for, I guess, about 13 years now. I think my first article on that, my first academic article on that topic was published in 1995. Um, so this book is sort of the culmination of actually a very long um, you know, sort of time studying these issues, although it does actually have new data and new information in it. Okay. Well, when did your interest um, begin with this topic? Yeah, it goes back a long way. I mean, I, I think really it all started um, when I was in graduate school at the University of Florida, and I was um, uh, working with the Sexual Assault Recovery ser Service. And um, there I met two incredible women who were running the service, um, uh, Debbie Burke and Claire Walsh. And they really started me thinking about what are factors that contribute to, violence, to sexual violence against women and girls in our society. And um, being in media studies, I started to think about you know, whether the media are playing a role in it. So, um, so that kind of began my analyses of, I started with women's uh, fashion and beauty magazines and looking mm -hmm. at how they portray, you know, magazines mm -hmm. like Cosmo and yeah, things like definitely. that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so how, what, their, um, what their constructions of female sexuality are. And, um, of course, it was all very sort of negative and, I mean, uh, you know, um, um, unrealistic and certainly, mm -hmm. you know, geared to a very sort of narrow definitions of what sexuality means for women and mm -hmm. everything was sort of tied to this male gaze and pleasing men and everything. And then I got curious about where it all started. So I started looking back at media aimed at younger girls, at teenagers. And so, and it was actually, if anything, worse when I started looking at like Seventeen and YM and magazines like that and television shows. Um, then I got curious about how girls were actually dealing with all of this stuff. So I was dissatisfied with just analyzing texts. Um, so I went into middle schools and I did, you know, I did ethnographic research with um, middle school girls, young teenagers. Mm -hmm. The research sort of shows that 13 is a real turning point for girls. So that was the age I was looking at. Um, and then, and so yeah, that's kind of how it all started. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Had you seen any differences in the magazines today um, compared to what you started with with your beginning research? Yeah, actually, it's gotten a lot worse. Oh. <laughs> I should have brought props oh. with me. <laughs> but um, actually, the more uh, recent issue of Seventeen, for example, um, has Paris Hilton on the cover. You know, and three hundred sixty-five <laughs> ways to look hot, which I don't think you would have seen actually. You know, ten or fifteen mm -hmm. years ago. So, um, so yeah, I mean, things have not. You I mean, th there's no, there's been no sort of progressive trajectory. Mm -hmm. You know. <laughs> now a lot of magazines magazines have those numbers, those yeah. lists. Is yeah. that a big selling point for that magazines? That's a huge selling point, and I'm not sure why. Actually, I'm really curious about investigating that because, uh, you know, somehow the numerology of it almost seems to give it more credibility or something. It's mm -hmm. very odd. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, in your book, you describe the several different cultural differences between the United States and other countries. Yeah. Um, can you describe some of those differences, a few of what yeah. you've seen in your research? Yeah, um, I haven't actually, you know, I haven't actually done field work in other countries, but I, do, I have looked at a lot of data from other countries. And and, um, you know, I think there are a number of different things we can look at. Uh, one thing that's really troubled me and that also kind of prompted me to write the book was that we're not doing a really good job of handling teen sexuality or preteen sexuality in, our, in this country at all. We have really high rates of teen pregnancy. Um, they're f uh, like twice as high as the UK and France. They're four times as high as Germany and they're eight times as high as Japan. So compared with other industrialized mm -hmm. countries, we're just pathetic. You know? Yeah. <laughs> we're just, you know, the kids don't seem to know how to sort of deal with sexuality, take responsibility, none of that. And um, um, the other problem there is also we have very high rates of teen STDs compared to other mm -hmm. countries. I mean, here in the U.S., one in four teen girls has a sexually transmitted disease. And so, um, so just along those lines, if you start looking at other comparable countries, um, yeah. we're really not doing a very good job of, um, you know, of helping our girls in particular cope with sexuality. And how can the problems that you mentioned be remedied? Is that something that can be primarily taken care of through the school or the home or a combination of both? 
Yeah, I think it, it's going to take sort of an, uh, an all-out uh, you know, effort by a number of different kinds of constituencies and groups. And we, one of the countries that I've looked at is Finland, and um, they're extremely successful. They have almost you know, sort of zero rates of teen pregnancy and very low rates of teen STDs and things like that. And I think it's because they keep it um, you know, sort of on the front burner as a public issue. Mm -hmm. So um, they don't, you know, they just, it, it, it isn't something that we, that, that's avoided or that's a taboo subject or anything like that. You know, they're very upfront about it. Um, there's education, yes, in the schools, but it's also something that, um, you know, that's very openly discussed in homes. And, you know, it just it isn't something that's shameful or clandestine or that, that people are afraid to talk of, about. And I think we need more of that. We need mm -hmm. to have sort of more open public discussions about what the problems are, what the, what the remedies are, you know, and how we can sort of, as a society, cope with these, these issues. Interesting. Yeah. What, why is sexualization such a taboo issue, do you think, in schools and in the home? Yeah, that's very interesting. I mean, we're, we're, again, I mean, compared to other industrialized countries, we're really, we have, we're very skittish about this, this whole topic of, you know, children and sexuality, mm -hmm. and particularly girls and sexuality. It's such a taboo, you know, for girls to even be considered as sexual, right? Young girls in particular. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and, you know, I, in a way I understand, but I think it's because we don't have a good understanding of what healthy, normal sexual development is mm -hmm. all about, you know? We sort of don't seem to want to deal with that. Um, and so we can only think of it in these really, you know, scary terms, actually. And I feel as though in America, we have a very odd, um, polarized sort of attitude towards sexuality in general, because mm -hmm. on the one hand, we're very puritanical. And, you know, that's probably comes from a Puritan heritage. <laughs> um, or maybe I should say Victorian. I don't even know. But... Um, but it, you know, there's there's the the impulse to you know quell discussions of sexuality, you know, not have sex ed in the schools, not have you know any open discussions of it, so that it, it's this taboo kind of thing. Um, but then on the other hand, we there's this anything goes attitude where you know in the media in particular, mm -hmm. there's like no limits and to. Um, to, to have any kind of critique of what's being represented immediately sort of puts you in this conservative camp. And so it's so polarized that we can't find the middle ground and we need the middle ground. Mm -hmm. You know, the middle ground is where all the productive discussion could happen, but it's missing in this society. Um, are there any cultures within the United States that maybe are more open to this topic than, than say, the standard white culture? Or is, the, or is it kind of just our country as the United States yeah, and our culture Yeah, that's a really alone. interesting, you know, are, are, is there, are there, you know, more progressive discussions of it? Uh, that, that actually, that would be something worth investigating. You know, I mm -hmm. don't really know of a lot of research on that, you know, how mm -hmm. sexuality is dealt with and discussed, you know, in different types of ethnic communities, say, or religious mm -hmm. communities or something like that. Um, I do know that if you break it down um, by race slash ethnicity, that Asian Americans have very, very low rates of teen pregnancy and, and, and so on. And so, mm -hmm. you know, maybe there's something about Asian culture. I don't, but I don't know what it is. You mm -hmm. know, I can't say that I have any real knowledge Lots there. Lots of um, research that could be done. Yeah. It's ongoing. That would be really terrific, actually. Um, but one thing I will say is that whenever I've done readings and whenever I've brought this topic up, I mean, mm -hmm. parents are incredibly interested in it and teachers and counselors. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've, the response to the book has been fantastic. And so I, I feel as though, you know, sort of we're ready for this now. People are wanting to talk about about it. Is there yeah. more, I mean, is there a, 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 a more outcry about this kind of research? I've mm -hmm. noticed that this is kind of a topic that comes up and mm -hmm. bubbles up every so often where people want to delve into it. And obviously the issue of body image and the media and how it affects uh, yeah. females in particular it's, it's is very huge. big. Yeah. And you discuss that in your book. Mm -hmm. um, are there any changes going on with that? Do you see, I know Dove has like a self-esteem mm -hmm. campaign mm -hmm. ad. Mm -hmm. Do you see that as something that's going to be remedied over time that we're going to start accepting <laughs> hopefully teaching girls to accept themselves and, and love themselves for who they are? You know, I really hope so. I mm -hmm. feel very hopeful about it. But in fact, the statistics haven't changed a whole lot. I mean, still, you know, we have very, we have the same sorts of spikes in anorexia and bulimia at certain points, you know, 13 being one spike. Um, still 90% of people with eating disorders are female, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I don't see the numbers changing a great deal. And when I actually do analyze the media representations, they're worse than they were before. Mm -hmm. So in spite of a few progressive trends like the Dove campaign, which I think is fantastic, really, mm -hmm. I do. And in spite of sort of greater awareness among um, women in particular, um, you know, I, I actually don't see real world shifts. And I think mm -hmm. we were gonna have to really work on that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, you had also mentioned that there's a very large communication differential between females and males, mm -hmm. um, especially young boys and young girls, mm -hmm. and, and how some young boys are starting to realize now that they don't have to marry a model. That was one of the <laughs> quotes in your book from a yeah. little boy. Yeah. Um, have you seen any results of the experiment of asking uh -huh. boys what their ideal woman is so that they can maybe start to learn that 
the media mm -hmm. isn't the best prototype <clears throat> to follow? Yeah, I actually don't, uh, I don't think there's been a lot of work done with boys along those lines because that quote that I used in the book was from a workshop I did um, in a sixth grade classroom. And after I had done my presentation and after I had shown them just how manipulated those images are and how nobody really looks like that, mm -hmm. you know, because I had a great little video that showed how um, in magazine images, for example, they make the waist more slender and they, mm -hmm. you know, they um, take out all the blemishes and all the things that they do so that even the model herself doesn't look like that. Um, you know, that really impressed the kids and they weren't aware of it at all. And that's when the little boy said, you know, now I know that my girlfriend doesn't have to look like a model because he <laughs> realized that the models were fake. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we need a whole, you know, one of the things I really push for in the book is media literacy education. Mm -hmm. And that's a first step just for kids to understand, you know, all the digitization and the, uh, you know, just how constructed that imagery is. And, and you know, so that they, they know that they shouldn't be trying to compare themselves with it in real life. Now, media literacy, is that something mm -hmm. that in your opinion should be started in maybe, like you said, like grade school, yeah. grade school ages and follow through high school, college? You know, I would like to see media literacy as a, um, a required part of the K through 12 curriculum. You know, I mm -hmm. think in this media saturated environment, it's as important, maybe more important, you know, than even learning how to read or write or do mm -hmm. math, right? Because we're just, we're just inundated with media. We're surrounded by media mm -hmm. images and, and children really do need to know how to cope with these things because the research does indicate a lot of negative impacts of media on young children. Um, and there's tons and tons of research on that. But, um, but actually, I would even suggest starting earlier, you know, because I think mm -hmm. very young children can be taught really basic in basic ways to question the mm -hmm. media. Like with my own kids, I started when they were like two and it wasn't necessarily about, you know, sexuality or gender or anything, but I would, you know, if we were watching TV and there was an ad or something, I'd say, why do you think they're telling us that sugary cereal is so good for us when we know it's bad, you know? And like, you know, I'd sort mm -hmm. of get them to, to think about what, how things are being sold and what the profit motive might be just in really simple ways. But, mm -hmm. Um, you know? Yeah, advertising is a whole realm of its own. Mm -hmm. And and what what kind of changes are there now with say digital media and mm -hmm. online? You know, you have now the internet, which is yeah. just a super highway of yeah. information and probably not so positive for some children. Yeah. What kind of changes um, may mm -hmm. come of that, or is that kind of putting a whole another yeah. issue on the table? It is. It puts a whole new and you know another issue on the table, as you're saying, because it's completely unregulated, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, and children, you know, most again, the research shows that most children have uh, have accessed pornography online, for example, you know, like uh, young adolescents. That's where they're learning about sexuality, which is really problematic, I mm -hmm. feel, because just because of the profit motivations behind pornography, you know, it's not that I think sexual representation is you know a terrible thing or anything, but but the way they're learning about it from those particular kinds of sources is you know again not healthy, not progressive, mm -hmm. you know, not contributing to sort of respectful relations, ethical relationships between boys and girls, you know, none of that. So, um, so you know, there's that. Um, uh, yeah, and there's, there, there is this whole question of just how much supervision kids are getting when they're on the internet, which is, you know, by and large, very little. Mm -hmm. And um, very, like, 75% of American kids have televisions in their bedrooms, too, which, you know, again, who knows what they're watching late at night mm -hmm. with no, you know, so. Yeah, the um, commercials can be a little sketchy at night. Yeah, I'm sure everyone's they can, seen and the programming, them. too. Yes, so, yeah. and actually, that's my next question. Yeah. Um, teen, you have mentioned in your book teen shows like The O.C., yeah. Gossip Girl, Laguna Beach, right. um, especially those teen reality shows now. MTV's kind of into this whole preteen reality thing. Yep. Um, they, you mentioned them as spreading the myth of the sexual goddess, mm -hmm. which is kind of this ideal form, this ideal body. Right. Um, why do you think these shows have become such a sensation? Mm -hmm. is, it, is it the content or is it the sexuality and, and is this becoming a staple for young girls and yeah, why? It's totally becoming, it's a staple of course. I mean the, the, the ratings are very high on those shows and you know most kids watch them. Um, so why are they so popular? I think there's a couple of reasons. You said, is it content? Is it sexuality? Yes. I mean, again, the research shows us that teens are drawn to shows with sexual content. Mm -hmm. Not surprisingly, you know, mm -hmm. that's kind of natural too, <laughs> because as you get to those years and puberty sets in and everything, then, you know, you want it, you get curious about sexuality. That's pretty normal. Um, so they gravitate to, to, to media with sexual content. You know, again, I think that would be okay if they were getting useful, accurate, sort of helpful messages about sexuality. Mm -hmm. They're not, you know, the, mm -hmm. what they're getting is just the kind of thing you're you're talking about myths of sexuality, which I identify in the book, you know, mm -hmm. one of which is, um, you know, only if a girl inhabits the, a Barbie body can she be sexual, you know, which mm -hmm. is, you know, medically speaking, scientifically speaking is garbage. Mm -hmm. I mean, ev mm -hmm. everyone is sexual. Everyone is capable of mm -hmm. sexual connection and expression and feeling. And so just this whole hierarchy where if you have the, you know, the Barbie body, you're somehow more sexual than someone who doesn't, you know, it's yeah. just, it, you know, it's just terrible really for people mm -hmm. to be believing things like that. Um, 
uh, you know, so, so again, and they're getting a lot of messages about how, um, you know, sex is sort of carefree and irresponsible and, you know, the sort of whole hookup culture that's in Gossip Girl and mm -hmm. everything, that there are no consequences, no emotional repercussions, no, you know, no need to even think about it very much. Mm -hmm. And on the more practical side, no contraception, no, you know, no, no, no precautions. So, mm -hmm. so, I mean, everything that they're getting about sex from these media is sort of really, I think, contributing to the problems that we're seeing in life, you know, the high rates of teen pregnancy mm -hmm. and so on, because what we're finding in the research is that um, you know, most kids don't know where to go for contraception, even if they think about using it. Mm -hmm. um, most kids don't know how to say no in a situation if they're feeling uncomfortable. Most girls don't. They mm -hmm. don't. So they don't know how to set their boundaries. They don't know how to establish comfort levels. They don't know. So you know, there's just a lot going on um, in real life that that shows, um, a, a, I think, an effect from these media mm -hmm. where they're you know they're learning very unrealistic and problematic and dangerous you know ideas about sex and not not learning that sexuality and sexual behavior comes with rights and responsibilities, that, mm -hmm. you know? Do you think these shows are a fad, or is this, I mean, everything comes and goes, mm -hmm. television changes and alters mm -hmm. all different ways in, in the kinds of programming. You know, yeah. we kind of had that big reality boom with the big networks, and that kind of subsided, but mm -hmm. do you think that these shows are going to remain popular? Do you think they're going to get younger? Yeah, I think they're, I think they're being uh, aimed at younger and younger audiences. I don't see them going anywhere. And again, the, the research, the content analyses that have been done you know, over 20 years or so shows the sexual content steadily increasing in mm -hmm. programming aimed at teenagers and children. So, um, yeah, so I don't see it stopping or, you know, in fact, I, I see it on a steady increase. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Um, the, because of the media's influence, which is what we're talking about, um, young girls are experiencing body and self-esteem issues, which mm -hmm. you had also mentioned. Um, what, what can be done, say, in the home for, for parents to help curb their mm -hmm. still-growing female, young mm -hmm. adolescent girl, yeah. from having these issues and starting to feel so self-conscious? Yeah, I think that's a great question, you know, and that's really in part why I wrote the book, because there, at the end of every chapter, there's, you know, concrete suggestions for ways that parents and, mm -hmm. and other caring adults, teachers, counselors, whoever, can... Um, you know, can help children cope with all of this because there are proactive things we can do. We can't just like throw up our hands and say, oh, well, you know, can't, can't control the media. It's all out there. You know, I give up. This is the culture we live in. You know, I, I, that's not a great response. Yes. You know, it's not a very like responsible response. And um, also it's a, you know, it's not true that there's nothing we can do. There's a lot we can do. So the first thing I suggest is to open up conversations with children, you know, and even as I'm saying, the conversations can start when they're very, very young and they don't have to be specifically about these kinds of things, um, but they can help children to sort of look at the television more critically or look at media more critically mm -hmm. from a very early age. Um, as they get older, you can start developing, you know, talking to them about a lot of these kinds of issues. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, and this is something I've done with my own daughters who are quite young, um, if they're watching Disney cartoons, um, you can say, do you really think any, a real person could breathe with a waist that thin, you know, which is something I have asked them because, you know, the <laughs> Disney heroines are just outrageously proportioned, mm -hmm. right? I mean, mm -hmm. really somebody oh, that, yeah, so, so, you know, and then they say, no, nobody could really, you know, you couldn't really breathe mm -hmm. if you were that skinny. And so they've learned to laugh at them, actually. Yes. So, um, you know, and I think uh, derisive laughter is a really great. <laughs> <laughs> That's very true. Yeah, a really great resistance. That's very technique. true. Um, um, yeah, you had mentioned that in your book, too, the Disney yeah. characters, which was very compelling. Yeah. Um, could you share with that a little bit uh -huh. deeper about the different kind of characters you had mentioned, like Pocahontas yeah. and, and those kind of characters? Well, one of the things I, I, I looked at when I, when I analyzed those shows and other people have seen as well is that um, very often the, the heroines are, you know, sort of partially clad while the, the heroes are fully clad, you know? Mm -hmm. So the heroes have all their clothes on and the women are sort of partially naked. And, and again, it's contributing to this idea that, um, you know, women, if you flaunt it, like you, the more you flaunt it, the sexier you are. And, and one of the things I'm arguing against, it, why I'm arguing against that is just that sexuality is incredibly complex and people are attracted to each other for all sorts of reasons, mm -hmm. you know, and it doesn't have to be about just sort of removing your clothes, which is like the most simplistic and ridiculous way to kind of project sexuality, um, then, which is really quite complicated. And the other part of that is just the idea that um, the more unclothed you are as a general rule, the more vulnerable a position you're in. And so if you've got a fully clothed male um, you know, gazing at and, and arbitrating the beauty of an unclothed female, the power differential is quite huge. So it puts women mm -hmm. in a you know, sort of less powerful position than men. And what I'm trying to work toward is ethical, mutual, and respectful you know, mm -hmm. relationships, sexual or otherwise. And mm -hmm. so those power differences are really you know, not okay. Um, and it's the same thing with fashion right now. One of the things I point out in the book is that boys' fashions have gotten to be sort of where boys are more and more covered up with big baggy jeans and big baggy t-shirts mm -hmm. and, you know, mm -hmm. so like boys' clothing yes. isn't about revealing more and more and more mm -hmm. skin, but girls' clothing is. And so again, it's contributing to that 
power difference where a fully clothed boy can be the arbiter of a, you know, of an unclothed mm -hmm. girl's body. And so that's, the, you know, it seems to me, and I'm not against, you know, I think people do look at each other um, with desire or whatever, but mm -hmm. it should be mutual. Yes, you know? yes, yes. It ought to go both ways. Yes, yes. And that's kind of also leading up into my other question. Um, you discussed throughout the book this ideal hotness, yeah. which is hot is just a phrase. It's a it's a hot phrase yeah. for hot, yeah. and it's very used. It's used with younger people. It's yep. used with college age people, yeah. um, <clears throat> and it's kind of this ideal that women try to achieve. Mm -hmm. In that same category, we also see five year olds playing twenty in beauty pageants, yes, which we do. kind of can warp perception in some ways. What yep. is your opinion on uh, on those kind of things and, yeah. and what you've seen in your research? Yeah, I'll take the hot question first because again, that is something that popped up again and again and again as I was analyzing these media, where mm -hmm. you know, as you're saying, even very young children are told that you know this piece of clothing is hot or this bracelet is hot. And so um, so girls are being told over and over and over again that they need to be hot, that hot is the, is the, you know, the sort of the best thing you could possibly mm -hmm. be. And, and as they're getting that message reiterated constantly, um, they're also getting the message that nothing else matters. So they're never seeing anything that says being smart is great or being artistically talented is great or being like a caring person is great or having community spirit and volunteering or, mm -hmm. you know, like any of those mm -hmm. things, being an environmental activist or like nothing else matters, only hotness matters. So you're getting this total one-dimensional girl and girls are being really... Um, you know, stopped, restrained from developing all of the complex aspects of themselves that add up mm -hmm. to a fully fledged human being, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think that's really, you know, not good for Missing girls. Missing the psychological yeah. kind of development that exactly. needs to come along with exactly. The maturity. Exactly, and mm -hmm. not like fulfilling the potential and the promise they may have mm -hmm. in other areas, mm -hmm. right? Because if they're so focused on being hot, then they're not developing, say, their artistic abilities or their athletic abilities or anything else that mm -hmm. might help, you know, lead to long-term um, you know, gains for them, mm -hmm. right? Long-term mm -hmm. success. Um, so again, I'm very, very troubled by this whole hot emphasis. And um, one of the things I cite in the book is a New York Times article that interviewed a number of high-achieving girls who were, um, you know, they were high school girls and they were, you know, they were kind of girls who were like, you know, excelling academically and, you know, playing violin and in the orchestra and, mm -hmm. you know, performing in theater performances and all of them said, but it, the only thing that really matters is to be hot. You know, so like mm -hmm. they were negating all these other things that they had accomplished and mm -hmm. focusing on that one, that one really elusive ideal that's so constructed by the media and that's so profit driven that nobody can actually achieve it. It's mm -hmm. just a pointless, you know, it's like fool's gold. Yes. Um, so, so, you know, that's really troubling to me. And then the other um, part of that, you said the beauty pageants um, where very young girls are. Yeah. And one of the things we're looking at in this, in contemporary society is an erasure of the, um, you know, the boundaries between childhood and adulthood. Yes. So that, you know, very young, you know, fashions that are being marketed to young girls are very much, you know, they're just like, you know, the clothes, like, you know, the Bratz dolls, for example, you know, um, they're dressed just like the women in the rap videos or the rock videos, right? I mean, they're, they basically look like streetwalkers. And, um, but there's a reason for it because the, all of those boundaries between childhood and adulthood are being erased. And the only metaphor we're getting for sexuality or attractiveness or desirability or anything is um, linked with sex work, basically. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so when you see very young girls um, adopting that those not only those sorts of outfits but projecting themselves so sexually in very adult ways, it's extremely, I think, extremely troubling and something we should be concerned about. I know that there are a lot of people who defend those pageants, you know, mm -hmm. and they say that it gives little girls self-confidence, it gives them poise, this, that, and the other. Um, and I have two counters to that. You know, one is if it's so great, why don't we see them for boys? I mean, if it's really helping mm -hmm. children to develop self-confidence yes. and poise and so forth, you know, they don't have them for boys. So boys are not being judged on, you know, projecting their bodies and, you know, twirling around catwalks and I mean, mm -hmm. it's just not happening so I just I don't buy it because it's not gender equitable um, and and the second part of that is that because of the the connotations of the clothing which we understand in our society to be sexual mm -hmm. um, it's it's almost um, it's positioning these children as sort of legitimate legitimate sexual actors um, which is really not okay you know because mm -hmm. little children are not they're not aware of what they're projecting they're not able to control their sexual lives and so we ought to be really taking care of our children and helping them to reach adulthood, you know, so that they can make good decisions for themselves when they're capable of making those decisions and not foisting it on them at ages when they're not capable of it emotionally or cognitively or anything. Mm -hmm. You had mentioned the, um, the, the young, you know, children's clothes looking mm -hmm. like teen clothes and the, mm -hmm. and the new toys like the Bratz dolls mm -hmm. and things like that. Do you think that that's also warping 
the boundaries for adults as well mm -hmm. that are buying these things mm -hmm. for their children? Yeah, I do. Um, because all of these images are not just circulating to children, they're circulating to adults as well. And so uh, many adults are, you know, are part of the same culture where children are being increasingly positioned, not just in sexual terms, but in terms that are related to sex work. And all of those are really, you know, really problematic trends. Um, and so to me, even though, you know, there's no, I can't prove, I can't, you know, there's no way to prove causality, but um, child pornography and child sex trafficking are just burgeoning. I mean, they're multi-billion dollar industries. And mm -hmm. so, uh, you know, all of this seems like it's, these are all related trends right now. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, do you, you said you had, what you had just mentioned um, about children being mm -hmm. sexual in other parts of the world and mm -hmm. the sex trafficking and child prostitutes. Mm -hmm. Do you see any of that declining? Um, the pre-sexualization, is that unchangeable for some of these cultures? Is mm -hmm. that something that is maybe part of their profit margin for their yeah. country? Is that something that they, they rely on? They do. I mean, that is true. <laughs> That's, that some of the, um, you know, the income from child sex trafficking is, you know, almost equivalent to the GNP of some of these countries. You know, it's really a significant source of income. But, I mean, every country, I mean, that doesn't mean that it's good. <laughs> it doesn't mean mm -hmm. it's okay, and it doesn't mm -hmm. mean we should condone it. And it also doesn't mean it's unchangeable. Um, most countries of, in the world have legislation against these kinds of practices. Now, the governments in some countries may sort of turn a blind eye to it and facilitate it sort of under the table, but um, nonetheless, there, there's a lot of, um, you know, there's increasing regulation now, there's increasing scrutiny. Um, it's not helping a lot, though. You know, mm -hmm. the, it, it, these, these um, you know, these sort of underground economies work, you know, the networks and the way they work are really successful. I mean, obviously there are, you know, there are, um, there are markets for it. Mm -hmm. um, but all we can do is keep trying, you know? I, I don't ever want to, like, believe that this can't be changed, mm -hmm. you know? Um, bio biologically um, speaking, or psychologically uh -huh. speaking, rather, why do you think media has, has such an effect on audience? Why, what is it about the way our <laughs> brains are set up that we, yeah. some of us believe and some of us can be rational and, and mm -hmm. pick through the lies, I guess? Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. I mean, I, uh, definitely education and especially media liter literacy education is correlated with it. Um, why, why are we so susceptible to it? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting idea. Um, you know, there's so many different theories about how people choose media and how people use media, mm -hmm. and it, it's, it does vary quite widely. Um, but people in the media industries are very adept at targeting their audiences, and so they're crafting messages that mm -hmm. are, you know, tested, and, uh, you know, they, they do their own research, too, to see how, what, what will appeal to certain demographics. And so they're working pretty hard to make them appealing to us, right? Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things I say in the book is that I don't think all media are bad, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you know, media can be entertaining. Media can be you know, relaxing, can be informative, right? I mean, and certainly I think educational television is great, and, um, but, but so is a lot of other television that's just fun and lighthearted mm -hmm. and whatever. So it's not that all media are bad, but um, what we do need to know, as you're saying, is how to be discriminating about it. Mm -hmm. You know, how to watch it with a grain of salt, how to yes. be able to bring a critical eye to it mm -hmm. and not be completely taken in by the messages that we're being sent, right? And, and uh -huh. that kind of ties back to your media mm -hmm. literacy idea and yeah. parents questioning advertising and media to their right. children. Right, and communicating their values and especially making it clear when their values are different from the sorts of values that are being, uh, you know, um, propagated, mm -hmm. you know, via the media. And one of the encouraging things that I found when I did research with kids is um, I did find, you know, in middle schools, I found some kids, not very many, but some girls who were just, you know, really clear-eyed and bright and mm -hmm. looking ahead to college and just not too impressed with any of this stuff, you know. And uh, I, I asked all of them, so why are you like this? You know, what makes you able to, you know, kind of not buy into all of these messages that you're getting? And they all said, every one of them said, it's because usually they said my mom sat mm -hmm. down and talked with me about this. But sometimes it was somebody else, you mm -hmm. know, a teacher or a dad or somebody. But it just showed that, like, um, they, they are, you know, even if they seem not to be listening, they are. They are listening mm -hmm. to their parents, you know, and those messages are getting through. And so, um, and then the other thing I found when I was talking to them was that they were really happy to be able to criticize, you know, like once you <laughs> gave them a space to be critical, yes. they noticed all this mm -hmm. stuff themselves, you mm -hmm. know, they knew that the images were manipulated and they knew that if they tried to do that in real life, it would come off as goofy or it would make them feel miserable. Mm -hmm. And just giving them the space to talk about it was so, uh, you know, was so like powerful for them, mm -hmm. you know. So um, um, shows like um, America's mm -hmm. Next Top Model, for yeah. instance, that can sometimes have a varying ideal. You know, there's very often many of the women on that show have the same body type, body yep. structure, but it's also showing um, how competitive the market is. Or yeah. is anything like that remotely the direction? I mean, is that kind of a change? Have you noticed that kind of being? I, I'm yeah. trying to figure out how to ask it appropriately, but. 
just that they're they're showing the competitiveness of the of the market. Do you yeah. think that's a wise choice, or is that mm -hmm. show still is are shows like that mm -hmm. competition shows, which are very popular, mm -hmm. are those still kind of yeah. teaching the wrong ideals? Yeah, I think there's a bit of both going on there. You know, because you know, if there's like a t there's this tiny progressive step where you might see that you know at least they're kind of exposing the competitiveness of the industry, and sometimes sometimes the way those con those competition shows or those reality shows are set up. Um, they're they're designed to make the reader, f I mean the viewer, feel superior, mm -hmm. you know, to the mm -hmm. contestants, right? I mean, mm -hmm. so they're kind of set up with a wink and a nudge, like you're too smart to be like these people, right? <laughs> so um, they're really positioning the reader, I mean, the viewer, as as somebody who's, you know, can be a critical viewer. But at the same time, that viewer is kind of immobilized watching that show, mm -hmm. you know. So there's not that much critique that can happen if you're still sucked into watching mm -hmm. it. And then the other part of that is that it still has these regressive messages embedded in it as well. So, you know, at the same time that it might be exposing the competitiveness of the industry, yeah, the body dot types don't change. And so these women who are impossibly skinny yet voluptuous at the same time, you know, which is a body not found in nature, um, <laughs> are still held up as the ideals, mm -hmm. you know, the, the pinnacle of beauty. Mm -hmm. So, so you know, it's, there may be some little progressive messages in there, but I think they're really undercut by all of the other messages. Um, it's the same thing in women's magazines, and I point this out, that every now and then they'll have an article that says, love your body, or mm -hmm. jeans for every size, mm -hmm. or something like that, and you'll, you'll, you'll look at it, and then page after page after page after page will be the same skinny, voluptuous models, right? The same mm -hmm. sort of Barbie bodies. Mm -hmm. And so whatever progressive messages in that one article is immediately undercut by everything else in the publication. Mm -hmm. So it's not really progress. <laughs> um, is, is there kind of a trend, too, in, in magazines that where they, when they say, love your body, mm -hmm. they've... They sometimes I've noticed in, in just magazines that I've picked up mm -hmm. that it's always a plus size girl that yeah. they're trying to make her feel yeah, better yeah. about herself. I mean, do they ever? Yeah. Do you ever have a skinny girl? And I never very, I yeah. very very rarely see a skinny girl um, that the is having trouble loving her body. Right. You know, at least right. according to the magazine. So, right. I've never seen it. Uh, yeah, yeah, I haven't either. And even their definition of plus size drives me crazy because I think it, they, I think they start at a size nine or something mm -hmm. like that, which mm -hmm. you know, I, <laughs> it's, it's absurd. It really is. Um, are males or fem and females? How are they so psychologically different? I mean, mm -hmm. I, I guess that's a question that. Yeah. It's very difficult to answer it in is. so many <laughs> facets. Um, but you had mentioned that violence particularly yeah. affects mm -hmm. males different than females mm -hmm. um, in terms of, of sexual violence yeah. and physical violence, mm -hmm. such as you know, what you see from video games. Why, do you, why is that? Have they mm -hmm. found any kind of link as mm -hmm. to why the brain mm -hmm. operates so different for both genders? Yeah. Well, uh, you know, most people argue that it's not hardwired. You know, that men are not hardwired to violence and, you know, because there are many, many gentle and caring, and you know, if, mm -hmm. if there weren't, we wouldn't have pediatricians and doctors and mm -hmm. poets. You know, mm -hmm. we wouldn't have men like that. So it's not like some innate characteristic of all men to be violent. That's not true at all. Mm -hmm. um, so really, what it comes down to is a culture that that defines masculinity as violent, right? And that that you know that tries really hard. And thankfully, most men don't actually buy into that, mm -hmm. right? But but all of the kind of constructions of masculinity in, in action films and in video games and in you know countless other media horror films is of the violent male and mm -hmm. so um, especially when boys are young I think if that's all they're getting in terms of you know messages about masculinity then that's what they're gonna subscribe to again those types of media are very carefully targeted to boys right I mean they're not really targeted to girl audiences um, when I looked at horror films and there's been a lot of analysis done of horror films mm -hmm. Um, you know, the, the, the monster, the scary, the murderer is always male. We almost always see the action through the murderer's eyes. So we're looking at it from the male viewpoint. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, girls, especially girls in sexual positions, are usually the victims. And so, you know, they're... And one of the things that I that has been, has been noted not just by me, but that I mention in the book is that um, um, usually right when the girl is removing her clothing or in a very sexy um, situation, that's when the murderer strikes. Mm -hmm. And so for any normal straight boy, that's a moment of arousal that's instantly coupled with violence. And so there's mm -hmm. this real linking of sex and violence in these media. So of course they're attractive to boys mm -hmm. because they're very arousing to boys, but then the violence is also you know, linked to that arousal. Yeah. So, so it that, very counteracts, I mean, it, uh -huh. it very, it very much plays yeah. with their emotions and yeah, what's going on inside. It does, and yeah. And I think we need to really be working to decouple sex and violence, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, sexuality really shouldn't be the, you know, like, you know, it shouldn't be violence, right? Yes, I mean, yes. in the end, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> Okay, um, you you mentioned video games and everything, and we had talked about the internet. Is there anything anything else about mm -hmm. the internet that's kind of um, 
it, 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 mm -hmm. so much of the internet is a pull instead of a push. Yeah. You know, some media is, it pushes and mm -hmm. others pull. Mm -hmm. The pull effect of the mm -hmm. internet is how can that how can that um, affect children especially? Yeah. It's, it's very interactive. I mean, the whole notion. So you're engaging very actively with the internet in ways that you don't engage with television. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that, that, that's very powerful. And, and they've looked at some of the research uh, in, uh, um, regarding video games as well, mm -hmm. or, or online games, because again, you're just so engaged in it and you're inhabiting a character. And um, so, right, those are, those are much more powerful media and they do, you know, the, but the research is pretty much in its infancy now with some of those studies. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, you know, I don't have all the statistics in front of me right now, but I do remember that um, they do see, they found more aggressive behavior in children who have played violent video games. I know that's been correlated. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I think we, again, we need a lot more studies of mm -hmm. how the internet is, um, you know, affecting children. We know a lot about television, but we don't know that much about internet activity mm -hmm. yet. And you mentioned mm -hmm. in your book several times mm -hmm. that you don't believe in censorship. Censorship no, is not the answer. It's no. very much the education, yeah. the literacy, and the opening mm -hmm. up and, yeah. you know, being very open to educational discussion of totally. this topic. Totally, yeah, I absolutely agree. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't, you know, I don't believe in, in in, in you know censoring any content really um i do think that we ought to be monitoring what children watch mm -hmm. you know that's not the same thing like i you know i really don't think that you know very young children should be watching you know graphic slasher films you know mm -hmm. that sort of thing i think we ought to be monitoring you know what they're actually watching and what kinds of media they're consuming Definitely. but right i don't think we should be banning anything you know i have mm -hmm. a real problem with like banning books and um I, i'm not well i shouldn't say anything because yeah i child pornography and things, I would yes, draw the line there. Yes. Yeah, but, but on the whole, I think censorship is not the answer. I think critique, analysis, education, you know, just ways to, ways to think about these things so that we can, we can be like active media consumers rather than passive audiences, mm -hmm. right? So that we can, we can construct our media environments in way that are, ways that are good for us and deal with them in ways that are good for us. Definitely. Yeah. Um, where, do you, where do we go from here? Um, you had mentioned that you, you're hopeful to see improvements, mm -hmm. um, but where do we go from here in this whole, is it a cycle or mm -hmm. is, is there nowhere to go but up or have we not hit the bottom quite yet or, or what, what do you think? I don't think we've opinion? hit bottom, but I do think we ought to start pushing back, right? So, um, so that's kind of, you know, that's one of the reasons that I wanted to write the book because I, I, I do think that this should all be a matter of public discourse, that we ought to be talking about these issues more and more, that mm -hmm. teachers should be talking about them, that, you know, par you know, there should be parents groups organized around these kinds of, you know, discussions, that policymakers ought to be getting involved with this, mm -hmm. um, that we all need to be talking about it a whole lot more than we do instead of just like ignoring it and letting mm -hmm. it get as bad as it can get. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, we, we, have, we have children's lives at stake and we have children's well-being at stake. And so I think it's really incumbent on us as a society to really take some proactive measures about that. Mm -hmm. One last question we mm -hmm. like to ask all of our guests are what are one of their favorite books that mm -hmm. has inspired them or that they particularly enjoyed that's by a female author? Yeah, yeah, I know. That's, you know, it is a tough question because there are just so many authors that have inspired me and so many books, so many feminist authors in particular that I've really loved over the years. I don't know if there's a single one, but one that I read recently that I like a lot is um, Ariel Levy's um, Female Chauvinist Pigs that's worth reading, I think. <laughs> okay, so, what yeah. is that about? It's about, it's a really, it's a very interesting analysis of the whole phenomenon of how, um, how women are sort of buying into this very macho culture uh, around, around female sexuality. And so, you know, somehow or the other, there's this rhetoric that girls gone wild, wild and things like that are somehow empowering to women <laughs> and that women are participating okay. in this whole culture that's in fact actually disempowering, right? Mm -hmm. What um, Susan Douglas calls the new sexism. So yes. it's, a, it's a really good analysis of all Interesting. of that. Interesting. Okay, yeah. well, thank you so much. I'd like to thank you again for joining us on our show today. It was great having you and hearing your expertise on the field. Um, again, Gigi's book is The Lolita Effect. You can find it at local bookstores in and around Iowa City and Amazon.com. Um, we'd also like to thank you, our UITV viewers, for watching Women at Iowa. Thanks again.